In the introduction to his book, Before Amen, Max Licato writes, I'm a recovering prayer wimp. I doze off when I pray. My thoughts zig and then zag and then zig again. Distractions swarm like gnats on a summer night. When I pray, I think of a thousand things I need to do, and I forget the one thing that I set out to do, pray. Can you relate? It's not that we don't pray at all. We all pray some. On tear-stained pillows we pray. In grand liturgies we pray. At the sight of geese in flight we pray. Quoting ancient devotions we pray. Surveys indicate that one in five unbelievers pray daily. But wouldn't you like to pray more, better, deeper, with more fire, faith, or fervency? We aren't the first to struggle. The sign-up sheet for Prayer 101 includes the names of Jesus' disciples. The only tutorial they ever requested was on prayer. They could have asked for instructions on many topics, bread multiplying, speech making, storm stilling. Jesus raised people from the dead, but a, how to vacate the cemetery seminar? His followers, followers never called for one, but they did want him to do this. Lord, teach us to pray. And this morning we begin a sermon series on called War Room. Uh, last Sunday evening, many had the opportunity to come and see the movie War Room, which is a very powerful and moving movie on prayer. And today we're beginning the sermon series with the message, When You Pray, from Matthew Gospel chapter 6, verse 5. And we are going to be launching small groups. Some have already begun. There was one, I believe, uh, Friday evening. There is one uh, during the connection hour this morning, and others will be beginning today and down through this week. If you haven't uh, had a chance to sign up yet, be sure to, to sign up and, and to go uh, to a group. And um, if you know where you're going, the, the list is in, in the uh, worship folder. Um, my small group leaders may not like this, but if you haven't signed up, just show up, and that'll be okay, and uh, find a place for you to sit on the floor or something, uh, but uh, it's a very important part of being, to be involved in the small groups. Matthew 6, 5, that our message is based on this morning says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. The first thing that we want to notice is that we have been invited and are expected to pray. The Old Testament shows us the expectation of prayer. God expects that we would pray. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 12 to 14, God is speaking through Jeremiah to make a prophecy to the people of Israel, and they were going to be carried off into Babylon, and they were going to be there for many years. And then finally, they are going to turn back to God, and God says this, when you turn back to me, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you... Seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And so through Jeremiah, God is prophesying that, uh, that there was going to come a time when Israel was going to be called off into captivity. And, and in their sadness and in their brokenness and all, all their distress, that they were going to turn back to God. God was expecting and anticipating that the people of Israel would turn back to him. I remember back in in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president and there was still a lot of interpretation going on about 
prayer in schools. The decision had been made in the 60s, but there were some questions about, can you do this, can you do that, and so on. And uh, Reagan was asked about it, and, and Ronald Reagan said, as long as there are math tests, there will be prayer in school. And uh, that can go for a whole lot of other kinds of tests that uh, are in school as well. There is the expectation of prayer. Even, even as Max Licata said there in, in that introduction of his book, even people who don't believe in Christ pray, some even daily. And then we also see the New, the New Testament invitation to approach God through Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin." Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, Through the blood of Jesus Christ and, and through the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven, we have an invitation to go to the very throne room of God. We have an invitation to come. There's an expectation that we will come. What a, what a great opportunity we miss when we let other things crowd prayer out of our lives. Well, a prayer is a wonderful privilege and yet a great responsibility that we have. We have been invited and expected to, to, to pray. And then also we have been provided reasons to pray. If you, if you are a person who tries to reason things out, why, why should I lay aside other things? Why should I take time? Why should I plan time to pray? Well, there are a number of things that Scripture tells us about this. The, f- the first is to bring healing to our nation. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 to 15, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. This was part of, of, the, of the prayer that came a- after the, the dedication of the temple. Solomon prayed a great prayer. And this is the response of God, that he would hear the prayers of his people. And I don't think I need to spend a lot of time this morning talking about why our nation needs to be healed. But in all of the brokenness, in all the division, in all the strife that we have in our nation, the Word of God gives us as a reason to pray, to pray for the healing of our nation. Then we also see that we are to pray so that the Father can be glorified in His Son. In John 14, 13, it says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. We need to keep that in mind. Sometimes we take these scriptures out of context and we just read the first half and it says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. And so we kind of think, oh, well, I think I'll pray for a new car today. And if that comes, we'll call, try for a new house next week. And, uh, you know, that, that somehow we're always supposed to be healthy and we're always supposed to be prosperous. That isn't what this scripture is saying. First of all, it says, whatever you ask in my name, that there's a, such a thing as power of attorney where you are granted the responsibility of acting on behalf of another person in their name. Perhaps they, they have d- dementia, or maybe there's some kind of a physical need that they have, or some reason why they cannot take care of their own business. And so you are able to write checks on their behalf in their name. But part of the laws that make that possible is also the responsibility that you are always to make those choices in the interest and favor of that person and to the best of your ability to use their funding the way they would use it, the the way they would desire to have it used. And so when we pray in Jesus' name, it's not somehow that we can just kind of tack on a phrase at the end of our prayer and get anything we want. 
When we pray in Jesus' name, we are using the authority of the name of Jesus for the work of his kingdom so that the Father, so, excuse me, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. That's the purpose of what he gives us things for. It's not for our own benefit. It's not for our own happiness. It's not for our own prosperity. But when we need something to accomplish the work of God so that the Son can glorify the Father, then, then God will provide whatever we need to do whatever it takes. And so that our joy may be filled. In John 14, 24, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. And, and, and we, we don't always realize this, but when God's will is accomplished, it brings us great joy. When, when we get what we want, there's one thing about anything in this material world. It's never enough. If you pray for money and you get money, you'll want more money. If you pray for material things and you get more material things, you'll want more material things. There, there's no level of satisfaction that ever comes that will ever be fulfilled by just accumulating money and material things. And, and so the purpose of, of this prayer is that the Son may be, bring glory to the Father, and through that then we will receive joy, and our joy will be complete. It, it, it won't leave us thirsting. It won't leave us uh, hungering and, and desiring more. We will be filled with the joy that comes from God. And then the third thing that we notice, that we have proof that prayer works. We have proof that prayer works. In, in, and we're going to just pull out a couple of the Old Testament examples here. Uh, first of all, uh, God heard his people. The, the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, and they cried out to God uh, for deliverance, and God heard their prayer. And in, exa in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, it says, during that long period, the period that they were praying for a leader, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God heard the prayer of his people. What great comfort that brings to us this morning. What encouragement that should bring to our hearts and lives that God hears the prayers of his people. Why should we pray? Because God hears our prayers. God heard the prayers of Hannah. Hannah was married, and, and uh, the, her womb was closed up that she could not give birth to a child. And, and they went to the temple, and, and she went alone, and she prayed and sought God. And she promised God, if you will give me a son, I will return him to you to do the work of your kingdom. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, the, the day after that prayer... Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Here was a specific prayer that God heard and that God answered. And then God heard the prayers of Elijah. Elijah was, was a great prophet, and, and he would travel through the land, and, and it was a t time that, uh, that there was famine in the land and, and drought because God had caused it to, to stop raining. And, and there was a, a widow who heard, uh, who heard of Elijah, and when he would come through town, she had a special place in her home where Elijah could stay. And this woman had a, a, a boy, and uh, he died and Elijah came, and the woman said, why is God mocking me? I've done everything that I can to, to, to help you and to serve you, and now my son has died. And Elijah went up to that little boy's room and prayed for him. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 22, it says, The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. God hears our prayers, and the Bible is full 
of answered prayers, the Bible is full of God hearing and responding to the prayers of those who seek him. Oswald Chambers wrote, we run ahead of God in a thousand and one activities. We get so burdened with persons and with difficulties that we don't worship God or intercede. We can become so busy with even doing good things that we don't take time to pray. And what a great, great opportunity that we miss when we don't pray. And so in these weeks, looking at uh, the prayer room study, and it's a Bible study on prayer. It's, it, it's based somewhat on, on war room, but it's a Bible study on prayer. And I trust that our hearts will be rekindled toward prayer. And with the highly charged rhetoric of this election year, we need to be reminded that we serve a God who hears our prayers and answers our prayers. There's a video that I want you to listen to. It's a message from Andy Stanley that challenges me and I trust will speak to you. Now, real quick, I want to say something to a couple groups, all right? First, I want to say something to all of you who are 45 years old and older. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? 45 and older. Look up here. Many of you have grown weary and you've lost heart. And the reason is because you have fixed your eyes on a political system. You have fixed your eyes on a political leader. You have fixed your eyes on the good old days. You fixed your eyes on the economy. And you are, you are growing weary and you need to knock it off. And I'll tell you why. Because you are scaring the children. You are. Now look up here, look, look. The generation that's coming along behind us are going to take their cue from us. And here's the cue we're giving them. Oh my goodness, if we don't get the right person in the, in the, you know, elected in office, it's the end of the world. If we don't fix the economy, it's the end of the world. If we don't have religious freedom like my mama and my grandmama had religious freedom, it's the end of the world. Oh my goodness, if we don't get the right laws passed, if we don't have the right policies, it's all coming unraveled. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look up here. Government and government matters, policies matter, but neither of those matter as much as men and women who understand this word. Faith, confidence that God keeps his promises and that nothing can thwart the plans of God. We know this from the Old Testament. We know this from the New Testament. We know this because the most powerful person in Judea, Pilate, looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? Crucify him, game over, it's done, let's move on. And the only reason you know who Pilate is, the only reason you know who Pilate is, is because you know the story of Jesus. Pilate, the governor, becomes a footnote in the story of Jesus. In fact, most of the first century people you know about, you know about because they're part of the story of Jesus. We have nothing to fear. So all of you people over 45, knock it off. You need to model for the next generation that God is in control. God can be trusted. Get involved in the political system. Get involved in culture. Get involved in your society. But you never fix your eyes there. You fix your eyes on Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's a reminder that I need. My friends, God was on the throne when Adam and Eve sinned. God was on the throne when Noah built the ark. God was on the throne when Sarah and Abraham had born no heir. God was on the throne when Moses and the children of Israel faced the Red Sea. God was on the throne when Joshua marched around Jericho. God was on the throne when David faced Goliath. God was on the throne when Daniel was thrown to the lion when Daniel was thrown to the lions. God was on the throne when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in the furnace of fire. God was on the throne when evil men sought Jesus' life from his first breath to his last. God was on the throne when Stephen and the apostles were martyred. God was on the throne when Christians were persecuted. God has been on the throne all through church history. 
and God is on the throne with Jesus by his side in 2016 when Christians are being persecuted and martyrdom increases around the world. God is still on his throne when terrorism threatens innocent civilians. God is on the throne when governors and major corporations and sports leagues and favorite uh, famous celebrities protest a state that forbids men from sharing bathroom facilities with women and little girls. God is on his throne no matter who's in the White House or who's elected next. Our king reigns from heaven. The Supreme Court is not in Washington, D.C., and the lawmaker of the universe is not elected for a term of office. God is on his throne, and he invites you and I to pray. Our hope is not in the White House. Our hope is not in the courthouse. Our hope is not in the joint houses of Congress. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our confidence is in him. Our God is sovereign. He is still on his throne. Jesus, King of kings, and Lord of lords has everything under his control. We must not live under worry. We must not be motivated by fear. We must pray. And I trust that through these coming weeks, in our small groups and in our services, that we will be motivated as never before to be praying people, to pray in our closets, to pray in small groups, to pray together for the worship services, that, that when we come together, it will not just be routine, but that God will be at work. The best posture in these troubled times is the posture of repentance and prayer. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior and you have never begun to follow Him, I want to tell you this morning the very first prayer that you can pray if you've never prayed before is Jesus, save me. I, re- I turn from my sin, I seek your forgiveness, and I choose to follow you. In my closing prayer this morning, I'm going to include that prayer. And if you have not yet asked Jesus to be your Savior, I would encourage you to do that this morning. Shall we stand together as we go to the Lord in prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your great grace. Sometimes as individual human beings and even as Christians, we feel hopeless and helpless against the onslaught of the enemy and what is happening in our world. But Lord... There is hope in you. There is help in you. You have all power and all glory belongs to you. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for prayerlessness, that you would motivate us to pray more. You've invited us to pray. You expect us to pray. You have given us great needs to pray for. Help us, Lord, to be a praying people. And may the ministry of this church And may the impact in this community be greater because of prayer. May we see in our own late nation and in our land a a revival, a spiritual awakening that will take place because of prayer. May this world change. May many people come to know you as Savior because we pray. And Lord, this morning I pray that there are people even in this room now who have never asked you, to forgive their sin, to be their savior. They've never chosen to follow you. I pray that they would join me in their hearts in this prayer. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Like all human beings, I was born in sin. I was born separated from you because of sin. I've committed acts of sin. But Lord, I humble myself before you. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I turn away from my sins. I turn to you. 
And I choose this day to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Forgive my sins and help me to live for you. Lord, I pray that you would answer that prayer in the hearts of those who have prayed it today. And Lord, may we not depend upon the news media or the educational system or the voices of our world to tell us who's in control. Lord, may we look to you. May we look to your word. May we fall on our knees and may we find power in prayer. You are in control. We give you glory today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.